Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching uh, Israeli News Live here on World Harvest Television Network. What a powerful message we had last week. Uh, in fact, we left right off right here on Malachi. We were looking at Malachi going into the two witnesses, the identity of the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. As remember, we talked about Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 specifically. In fact, let's go back to that uh, just for a moment. And... Uh, Let's take a look at that once again. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 25 through 28. Wanted to share this with you because it is a powerful uh, insight that lets us know. It's, in fact, it's the main argument for those that believe that it can't be Moses and Elijah because Moses, they say, died. And Moses can't die again. Well, that kind of throws the whole idea about Lazarus out the door because Lazarus, you know, he was raised from the dead after being dead for three days and stinking and, and had to die again. Uh, and of course, some people try to say, well, there's no scripture for that. All right, well, here's where the argument comes from. Hebrews chapter 9, right? Going to verse 27, And as it was appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Anthropos is a human being. It's one man, not men plural. So let's back up to verse 25 and notice, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year without with blood of others. For then must he, he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. You see what I'm saying, friends? Jesus did not have to die no more than one time. The prophecy of about a man be appointed once to die is speaking specifically of the sacrificial Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, nobody else, no one else. And yet so many people think it's the other way around. Let's take a look at another fascinating prophecy here. This is where we begin to start to see who the two witnesses are, looking at it from a prophetic point of view, looking at it from the scripture. Let's examine this and see if the Bible itself will identify for us who those two witnesses really will be. Matthew 17, chapter 17, verses 11 through 12. I'll set the stage for you. Jesus' apostles, they're asking him the question, I thought the scripture said that Elias must for, first come. Because we know, naturally, he's going to Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, and there's another prophecy as well. We all, you know, all these prophecies speak of, of the coming of Elijah, but Malachi chapter 3 speaks of the coming of Elijah as well as Malachi chapter 4. But you have to watch Malachi chapter 4 closely because it's speaking about two different times of Elijah's coming. And we're going to find that out because clearly it's going to be identified in the New Testament that John only fulfilled half of Malachi chapter 4. Going to get into that in just a moment. Let's look though at how Jesus answers them when they ask him the question, doesn't the scripture say that Elias must first come? Which is Greek for Elijah. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall the Son of Man suffer of them. All right. We have to first take into account the fact that John, he did not restore all things. Jesus himself restored all things, but undoubtedly there must be a falling away. Remember the Bible prophesies there will come a falling away? Mm-hmm. Well, Elijah is to restore us back to the Word of God because of that falling away. That's why Jesus puts it, and even the Greek is exactly true the way it's worded in English, shall first come and restore all things. And it seems we know John didn't restore all things. Something must happen again. The coming of Elijah must come again. And most all scholars will agree with that, other than the people that believe that it's Old and New Testament. Okay, that's, that's a little different. Some people, people believe it's Jew and Gentile are the two witnesses. I don't agree with that, but that's okay. But where did we leave off at? We left off here at Malachi 4, and 4 and 6, and Luke 1, 17. Looking at Luke 1, 17, And he shall go before him in the spirit 
and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That is the prophecy of John. That was being said by the angel uh, Gabriel as he spoke to his parents about who John would be. He would go forth in the spirit of Elijah and that he would do what? He would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, clearly quoting from Malachi's prophecy, the last prophet of the Old Testament of, uh, uh, of Israel. And but he doesn't speak about the other part of the prophecy of Malachi. Let's take a look at Malachi. Watch what Malachi says here in chapter 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Did you notice how Moses is linked into this prophecy as well? Now John does fulfill the turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children. And some people might ask the question, we said it last week, what is the heart of the fathers? The fathers we have to identify first. We always see in the Bible, you'll be buried with your fathers. The fathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and sometimes Joseph is included in there with it. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their desire was the coming of the Mashiach. Abraham says, I'm a pilgrim. I'm a stranger in a strange land. He met the king. He met Melchizedek. Melchizedek, a type of Yeshua. He is a high priest. He has no father. He has no mother. He has no beginning of days or ending of life. Melchizedek had to have been. I, I've wondered if it wasn't Christ himself before he came in a, in a, in a, carnal, uh, a carnal body here on the earth. Now, some argue different on that, but I can't help but think that Melchizedek, if he has no father, he has no mother, he has to be God in flesh. No, ending, no beginning of days or ending of life. Think about how great this high priest was. All right, so Melchiz excuse me, Abraham, after meeting this king, he had the testimony that he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He was looking for the coming of the Mashiach. He was looking for the Messiah. So was Isaac. So was Jacob. And Joseph's entire life was nothing but a mirror of that of the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. Fascinating. Incredible prophecy, right? But John... He fulfilled part of that, but he doesn't fulfill turning the heart of the children to their fathers. Because when Jesus did come, there was a, a remnant of those that believed him. But we never saw Israel. We never saw the prophecy of Romans 11 where Paul speaks about that all Israel shall be saved, quoting from the, an Old Testament prophecy. That they're blind in part for your sake. For the Gentiles' sake, they're blinded for your sake, so you have an opportunity to recognize the gospel. They're even an enemy to you. How many people, how many Christians, they can't stand the Jews today, they say, because we're treated so evilly by them. Well, brother, sister, have mercy on them. Have patience with them. They're blinded for your sake. Giving the Gentile the opportunity to come in. Give them time. They're waiting for Moses and Elijah. Right? And you're going to find out. Do you know that Rashi, the famed Torah commentator, believed that Moses would be back right around the time of the millennial reign? Many of you may not be aware of that. So turning the heart of the children back to the fathers, in other words, getting the children of Israel today to recognize the Messiah. Because the fathers long for the coming of the Messiah, so the two witnesses have to get their heart, or Elijah gets their heart ready for the coming of the Messiah. And why? Because the spirit that was upon John was the spirit of Elijah. That spirit of Elijah is a witness to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Didn't know that? You'll find out more. Let's continue on. Let's look at Revelation 11. Let's go to verses 3 through 6 with Revelation 11 now. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. 
Remember Matthew 17, 17, verse 3, Mount Transfiguration. Keep that in mind. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Just like Elijah did. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 10, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven. Verse 6, Revelation 11. These have power to shut heaven, it rained not in the day of their prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Exodus chapter 7 verse 20, waters were turned to blood. So Revelation is identifying the spirit of the two witnesses and what was upon them. And clearly, as we see in the book of Kings, it was clearly in 2 Kings chapter 1, it was Elijah. Remember when the 50 soldiers come up, the king demanded, Ahab wanted him to come down. He said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down out of heaven and consume you then. And it did. And it just consumed the 50 men and, and the captain as well. First two times. It's not that fire is literally coming out their mouth like some of the pictures show, like a flamethrower. As he speaks, what he says will happen. Okay? Moses was the one that took his rod and turned the waters to blood. Moses and Aaron together, and Aaron wouldn't have been there had it not been that Moses kept complaining to God. You know, I'm too weak, I don't, I don't, I don't got a problem, I can't speak right, I stumble, I stutter, everything else. Okay. I'll send Aaron with you then, seeing you don't think you can speak very well. Amazing. Now, let's move on. Revelation 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 3. Look at this closely here. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them to a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment it was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Didn't it just say, don't we just, didn't it just say in Revelation that these are the two olive branches on either side of the golden lampstand or standing before the God of the earth? And here, you're given a preview of the two witnesses right in Matthew 17. Moses and Elijah standing on either side. Jesus is the olive tree. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Paul in Romans says it's, he's the olive tree. He's also the root of Jesse and the offspring. He's everything, friends, and, and yet here, those two branches of the olive tree standing with the root itself on Mount Transfiguration, God showing you who your two witnesses are, identifying them for you. Amazing. Now let's take a look at some of the prophecies here with Moses. Exodus chapter 15. As you're looking here on your screen. Now I'm not using King James Version here because I wanted you to see from mechonmamory.org. Uh, the actual Hebrew. If you're looking at this now, notice everything that I have circled in red. There's specific things that I want you to see. If we read in English, they say, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider hath he thrown on into the sea. All right, now, I'm not, the Jewish people, which I am Jewish by birth, my, both my mother and father were Jews, uh, not practicing Jews either one, especially my father's side, they have been Christians for many, many generations, but we come from a long line of, uh, of Jews. Uh, my mother's side were practicing, but kept it secret to the last part. But what I wanna share with you though, uh, or what I wanna to say to you here, when I get to the part where we have the divine name of God, yod heh vav -Heh, people call it Jehovah, Yehovah, Yahweh, etc. Just like the Jewish people that say today, we don't know how to pronounce the name. So I generally don't. I normally just use Adonai for that when I read it in the Hebrew language. I'll do that as well here. Zephaniah's prophecy actually speaks about that the name of the divine name of God would be restored again at the time when Israel is encompassed about with armies in the last days here. So it is coming. Uh, we do know one place for a fact that the divine name was used 
But a lot of people don't even think about it. And that's over in the book of Exodus when God asks, or Moses asked God, what they will ask me, Mashimo, what is your name? He says, what do I tell them? And God says to him, Ihaye Asha Ihaye. Do you know in the Aleppo Codex, one of the oldest known Hebraic language writings, that Abraham identified the eternal Father God as Ihaye, or Aye. Is one way you can pronounce that as well. Aye or yeye. Asha yeye. So God said, tell them, I am who I am. He is the I am. He is eternal. So let's look at now in the Hebrew. Az Yeshia Moshe Uvane Yisrael et Hashira Hazot. Ladonai ve Yamhu le mor. Notice what's in red now. Ashira Ladonai ki ga'a go'o, excuse me. Ga'a sus verkevo rema beyom. What is Moses doing here? This is something that even Rashi, the great Torah commentator from about a thousand years ago, noted. The fact that Moses put the singing of the song of the defeating of the horse and his rider in the future. It's what we would call the Antichrist spirit. Now, granted, They've already come across the sea. Pharaoh and his army was drowned in the sea. 600 horses and riders were all drowned. But Moses is not talking about 600. He's talking about one horse, one rider. And he says, I will sing in the future about the victory over the horse and his rider, singular. It's never been fulfilled. Could it be that Moses was alluding to a future event? even perhaps unbeknown to him. Maybe so. Let's look at some more prophecies about Moses that a lot of people overlook. Exodus 34, verses 10 through 12. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels, marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, and the Perzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. Now, here's what gets interesting. Do you know the word marvels was actually changed in English to the word marvels? It should be wonders. Rabbis actually admitted the fact that it was changed to marvels because they could not come to a comprehensive understanding how Moses could do something greater than the parting of the Red Sea and all the plagues inside of Egypt if he had already died. And so, as you see on the screen and behind me here, Ose Nifalot, the Hebraic words there, Ose Nifalot, I will do wonders, and God specifically identifies with Moses. One man, he's going to do wonders that have never been done in all the earth. This, he's already crossed the Red Sea. He's already taken and did all the plagues in Egypt and destroyed a nation single-handedly, a guy with a stick in his hand. This is a prophecy, friends, that has yet to be fulfilled. And Moses has got to come back and fulfill this prophecy right here. You know, it's amazing some of the things that we overlook in the Bible because we don't pay attention. Amazing. Revelation. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 11. Let's look at verses 7 to 9 now. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves." 
All right. Here's another fascinating thing about your two witnesses. What, what, there, there's a couple of things. One, we know that Elijah is coming to restore all things. Jesus said he would. Remember, we saw that in, the, in Luke. I believe in Matthew as well. Both speak about that he restores all things. It's a future coming. But have you ever thought, step, stop back and to think they're witnesses, but they're witnesses to more than, more than you could ever imagine. One, they're a witness to the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. They were right there with Jesus on Mount Transfiguration and discussed with Him, as the Bible says, what He was going to suffer. You remember the argument when Jesus was placed in the grave and the, and the Roman soldiers uh, were sent there to guard the grave that nothing happened, but of course the angel comes and moves the stone back, Jesus resurrects, the body is gone, and then they, they came up with this elaborate story that... Uh, they, they, were, they got drunk, they were asleep, and the, and the disciples come and stole his body away and, he, and, and took him somewhere else and buried him. And it said that that story was commonly spread even unto this day. And it is. Do you know even in Judaism, there's a lot of Jewish people that believe that, no, he just died a natural death, lived in India and died a natural death, and that was the end of him. That his body was stolen away. This is one of the witnesses that the two witnesses are here to do. They will be killed. Their bodies will lie not in graves, but in the streets for three and a half days, longer than what Jesus was there. And the reason it's done this way, and the whole world sees it, because it has to be for a witness. It, they are witnesses to the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but their bodies will be on public display these major news medias like CNN, Fox, and MSNBC, and, 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 and uh, RT News, and Sputnik News, and BBC, and Reuters, all these guys are going to cover these men's bodies laying on the earth. And when they rise up, it is a testimony then that truly, as they witness that Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever, the world will see that what their message that they brought was bringing a restoration. Moses is a witness also to the law. What was given to him where? Remember, remember what we read a little bit earlier? What, what did uh, uh, Malachi say? Remember ye Moses my servant and the law that was given to him on Mount Horeb? The judgments and the statutes. Do you know that in Deuteronomy, when Moses was on Mount Horeb, no, not Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, he got the Levitical law. That's because Israel didn't want the simplicity of the law. Remember, God said, I'll write it on the tables of your heart. You know, you could fit the Ten Commandments and the two statutes that he got on Mount Horeb. You could fit them in your heart. In other words, you could remember those. Try remembering 613 laws. Ezekiel says he'll give them laws that they can't even keep. But the simple commandments, as even Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto to, to me. You know, don't lust after your neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not kill. The simplicity of the commandments that Moses taught at Mount Horeb. And he had two statutes. And God says in the, in, the, in the book of Deuteronomy, and he added no more. So Moses is a witness to what God said to him as he met him at the burning bush. And he returns as a witness to Israel of what God intended for them to do and to know. Because remember, Jesus, he challenged many of the traditions. Many of the traditions he was challenging when he came here on the earth. He said, it's been said of them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, remember that? If a man smites you on the face, turn him to the other cheek. If he takes your coat, give him your cloak also. And Elijah is a witness. He was here. His spirit was inside of John the Baptist as a forerunner to the Messiah. 
He saw, he's a witness to the to the Spirit of God descending upon Yeshua as a dove. He is a witness to that he was indeed the Mashiach. Elijah was, as his spirit was inside of John. So I believe that the two witnesses are on the earth today. They're here now. There's two men born on this earth to be a witness to these things. And I'll tell you something, friends. I also cannot help but believe that both the, uh, the Gentile bride as well as the Jews, the Jews, their eyes will come open. But remember how the scripture also speaks about ten people of the nations or the Gentiles will take hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, we hear the Lord is with you. Show us your ways. Do you think that the Christian church is really trying to know the ways of the Jews today? Something miraculous happens to the Jewish people that causes the nations to take hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, we hear that God is with you. You have to first hear that God is with you. Show us your ways. That's your two witnesses. And I mean, think about it. We talk so much about a, a rapture. We talk so much about a bride. Christ having a bride. And yes, he's coming for a bride. Joseph is a beautiful type of that. Joseph did not marry an Israelite girl. He married Asenath. I am my name, Benun. We are descendants of the tribe of Ephraim through Joseph, or Joshua, excuse me, Joshua Benun. That's where we get our, that's our heritage. That's what's been said in our family for 500 years now, that we are his descendants, which takes me back to Ephraim, which Ephraim would be my way back, great, 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 great grandmother and grandfather would be Yosef, Joseph, and Asenath. I'm a half Jew, half Egyptian. In that regard, of course, it's already been watered down all the years. But my family stayed Jewish, though, their entire lives. But here's what's interesting. He married a Gentile bride. Christ took a Gentile bride. Right? Oh, so beautiful, these things. So, so beautiful. We're, we're almost out of time. Let me read here Revelation 11, 10 through 11. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. This is after they're dead. And shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Friends, this is a serious, serious hour we're living in. Let me just really encourage you. If you're watching this broadcast and you have not truly known Jesus Christ to be your Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, I encourage you. Give your life to Him. As a Jewish boy, I did so in a church called London Baptist Church at eight years old. Church my mother visited. Never went back again. But I give my life then. Won't you consider Him as your Savior today? If you like, I'll pray for you. You send me an email, IsraeliNewsLive at gmail.com.